Hi, my name is Karen de Kock from South Africa. My name is Nsamu Mwonga, originally from Zambia and living in South Africa. And we will greet you now in the official languages of South Africa. Thank you. Thank you and enjoy singing with us and do whatever your body allows you to do. Dumela Sanvonani Moweni Huyamore Lochani Amusheni Macheloni Good morning Hello and welcome to the 16th World Congress of Music Therapy Spotlight Session on Access and Empowerment. I'm Hilary Moss and I'm honoured to be moderating this session. It's an exciting and topical session with esteemed speakers from across the globe. A music therapy approach that values people, their empowerment and resources and their right to access appears to be a culturally dependent practice. This spotlight session features highly experienced music therapists and clinicians. They're leaders in their field with a wealth of practice. And it gives us an opportunity to reflect and focus on this really important topic. For example, how do we ensure fair access to music therapy services in our own country, in our community, and in our own private practice? How do I support empowerment? For example, do I invite input by service users into how my service is delivered? Do I give adequate information to enable people to make decisions about their therapy engagement? And how does my culture and society encourage or diminish empowerment? So without further ado, I am going to introduce the four speakers and leave you to hear from their experience and expertise. Today we have speaking Dr. Marisol S. Norris, Hiroko Miyaki, Dr. Rain Nassen, and Professor Daphne Rickson. I apologize in advance if I pronounced your names wrong. Please forgive me. We come from across the globe with speakers from as far as Japan, South Africa, New Zealand, and the US. I invite you to engage with this session and reflect on the issues of access and empowerment. And thank you for your time. Oh, 
has got a home at last. Mona, Mona, ain't you tired of moaning? Fall down on your knees and join the band with the angels singing no harm, no harm, no harm. Tell Brother Elisha, no harm, no harm, for Mona's got a home at last. Mm. Hormona's Got a Home at Last is an African-American spiritual. It was constructed and passed down through oral traditions that not only preserved its musical construction, but the embodied legacy of Black personhood in all its complexity. A lamentation, it signifies the pain, struggle, hope, and despair of enslaved peoples of the African diaspora who, in the face of unyielding brutality and degradation, found death an act of resistance and a welcome relief. As in the Middle Passage, when enslaved Africans chose to jump overboard slave ships, preferring rebellion and death over chattel slavery, this song exemplifies the complex relationship between physical death and what Orlando Patterson coined the social death of enslaved peoples whose humanity was pawned as political economy and profiteered by white oppressors. It's with this concept I open up our discussion. For some joining the spotlight session, you may question my desire to embark on a conversation of death when charged to speak of access and empowerment in music therapy. After all, what does this potentially solemn discussion offer social justice? The realities of the COVID-19 pandemic having a global impact have amplified the numerous social and economic inequities and systemic health disparities experienced by disenfranchised peoples at the margins of our societies. We could certainly find a range of possible topics that would speak to the life-affirming potential of the music therapy profession and support a music therapy agenda that promotes the current work to meet global needs of equity and justice. However, while at this time people are undoubtedly considering the existential crisis of life and death, the paradox of the vast devaluation of Black life to the point of torture and execution lays at the center of my being. At a time when our communities are tasked to meet the demand of the preservation of life, the necessity of breath, the calls for justice for George Floyd's last breath ripple throughout protest-filled streets. And while I sit here in my family's home in Kissimmee, Florida, I'm effortlessly reminded of the interconnectedness of both life and death, hope and disillusionment, and the aspiration of social justice in which most conversations of empowerment and access must contend, physical death. I often grapple with this idea of death, recognizing the multiple ways music therapy participates in the racial oppression of Black people. Ta-Nehisi Coates simply states, but all of our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, and even white supremacy serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscles, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. But so often in music therapy, we do look away. Reflecting on my experience as a music therapy student, I keenly remember our first case study of Johnny. Johnny was a 41-year-old cis man whose stay on a short-term psychiatric inpatient unit was nearing its end. Johnny's case summary detailed diagnostic features, health service encounters, non-adherence to medical treatment, 
history of drug abuse, and his upbringing in a city district. Prior to entering the hospital, Johnny's aunt, with whom he lived, died, and Johnny was left without his primary support. As I and my class members witnessed video footage of his initial music therapy assessment, we discussed Johnny's diagnostic features. Despite the presence of a depressed mood and possible response to internal stimuli, Johnny played the xylophone with a level of familiarity. Although no musical training was inferred, the professor mentioned Johnny's musical affinity to jazz as a cultural reference. Students commented on the musical interaction and noticed his blues and jazz reference and occasional sweeping melodic lines that were supported by the jazz chordal accompaniments of the music therapist. As a class, we discussed the self-direction of his musical responsiveness that was couched within a discussion of potential schizoaffective symptomology. We discussed the importance of strength-based assessment and Johnny's evidence health that may not have been witnessed if not for the presence of music. And while a rousingly complex discussion of musical engaged health ensued, the classroom discussion of Johnny's musical presentation was paired with a static and unidimensional preoccupation with Johnny's potential therapeutic compliance and overall cool musical demeanor. As we peered into Johnny's world, we discussed endless aspects of his case. All the while, his existence as a black man within politicized systems of music and health were minutely explored, and racial determinants of his experience remained unnamed and unacknowledged, thus rendered invisible. At the risk of centering whiteness to the point of our own erasure, I, like many Black music therapists and students, tasked to theorize and integrate disparate knowledge from varying disciplines, have cried from the hinterlands in need of places that affirm our Black subjectivity, our Black representations, our Black aesthetic experiences, and their meaning within music therapy contexts. The intentional and unintentional suppression of Black narratives, Black aesthetic discourse, and their theoretical contributions to the profession index a greater alignment to and perpetuation of color evasiveness, an unacknowledged existence, a third worldness within music therapy as detailed by Cliff Joseph in 1974, Art Therapy and the Third World, largely apparent to Black therapists between the lines of music therapy discourse. These enactments index the developmental progression of predominantly white disciplinary institutions that contend racial visibility and a music therapy field as a space that until recently had minimally considered the politicized nature of its work. The continued contending of black therapists, students, and clients alike within socioeconomic and political matrices of power inherent, not only within our expansive ecological systems of our society, but within music therapy systems itself, represents the point of resilience and common displacement and disillusionment, disintegration of black narratives and their inherent struggles to survive. Consequently, psychological wounds afflicted upon black music therapy participants are relegated invisible because their lived realities continue to be unnamed and unacknowledged while white supremacy in music therapy aims to perpetuate our devaluation and assault to our sense of self, our social death. I record this speech on the second week of US protests that demand justice for George Floyd and black lives. As the solidarity of protesters and the multi-generational work and strategic planning of community activism are made evident in grassroots organizing, social media streams, and news outlets. I'm reminded that death has always been on the other side of power and access. The cries from the streets, I can't breathe, that reiterate George Floyd's last words as he gasped for air choked from his body beneath US police officer Derek Chauvin's pinned knee for almost nine consecutive minutes amplify the radical resistance that would relentlessly work for the freedoms of all peoples and the brutal injustice that would attempt to measure the worth of black lives. George Floyd's lifeless body made public display is invariably tethered to the last words of Eric Garner, another black cis man who too was asphyxiated through excessive force by US police. Both laid cold on a city street, tethered to a countless number of Black people whose lives and deaths are part of a history of police brutality, anti-Black violence, and white supremacy. Protests echo justice for Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old cis woman 
who was shot eight times and killed by U.S. police while she lay lying in her bed on March 13th. They echo justice call for Tony McDade, a black trans man in Tallahassee, Florida, who on May 27th was fatally shot by police with details yet unknown. For Sean Reed, 21 years old, shot in the back while laying on the ground before the police on May 6th. For Stephen DeMarca Taylor, Manuel Ellis, Ahmaud Aubrey, Arian McCree, Atatiana Jefferson, Pamela Turner, Miles Hall, Botham Jean, Stefan Clark, Jordan Edwards, Corinne Gaines, Sandra Blonde, Khalif Browder, Yvette Smith, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Megan Huckaday, Tamara Rice, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Roser, Michelle Chousseau, Mike Brown, Renisha McBride, Jonathan Farrell, Trayvon Martin, Amadou Diallo, James Byrd Jr., Emmett Till, Mary Turner, and the many more names of Black peoples whose lives necessitated the urgent call, All Black Lives Matter. As the demands for Black lives reverberate throughout U.S. streets, I would be remiss to think that these fights for justice exist in isolation. Calls for George Floyd and for racial equity and police reform and defunding echo from Pretoria, Kingston, Rio de Janeiro, Madrid, Edinburgh, Manchester, London, Brussels, Frankfurt, Tunis, New Delhi, Seoul, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Sydney, and from Palestine. They amplify the rising articulation of demands and actions by social and political movements across the globe and the interconnectedness of these struggles. This solidarity speaks to the anti-Blackness that permeates much of our globe, as well as the unyielding violence against humanity that necessitates centering the apartheid conditions of Palestine, the xenophobic violence against Nigeria and South Africa, the civil rights violations in Hong Kong, war crimes in Syria, and the neocolonialism that continue to oppress the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the land called Australia. They center food apartheid, forced sterilization, tuberculosis, non-communicable diseases in low resource communities, racial trauma, and a wide host of health injustices linked to medical apartheid. They collectively signify the physical and metaphorical needs placed at the next of oppressed peoples and the demand of protesters, so-called rebel dreamers, who would combine the urgency of radical imagining with the call of unrelenting action for freedom, even unto death. At this moment, just as I have named names of the Black people who have been murdered by systems of anti-Black oppression, I invite you to reflect on the many oppressed from your communities that have experienced death at the knees of systemic injustice. Music therapy across the globe is situated within a complex sociopolitical context. Although often narrated as a small but growing profession, even marginalized in comparison to traditional healthcare approaches, music therapy holds the vestiges of white European settler colonialism and is founded upon prevailing cultural values and ideals that support its existence and simultaneously benefit and harm clan communities. As the field attempts to increase professional legitimacy within research and reimbursement driven healthcare systems, practice based on empirical data have become a growing priority and of lesser concern are the peoples at the margins that have been decentered in our collective work. The dominant cultural narratives that permeate our general assumptions of music, health, personhood, relationship, community and culture serve to expand territorial ideological empires, uphold cultural and institutional dominance over indigenous and marginalized worldviews and music and health practices, and uphold and reinforce oppressive healthcare systems. Furthermore, in many ways, music therapy is superimposed a subordinate nature of minoritized therapists within education, clinical, therapeutic, and research practice. Marginalized therapists like myself often navigate a barren disciplinary landscape with little to no scholar distinction of the sociopolitical, sociocultural, socio-structural realities that mark both our and our clients' existence. 
While dominant groups comparatively draw from the same culturally narrow literary canon that too often takes an etic, one size fits all approach to cultural realities, the potential risk for therapeutic harm to minority clients steadily increases in the lack of culturally relevant theoretical frameworks, community engaged models, and community centered research. Marginalized music therapists often seek and cherish marginalized music therapists, author activists, and community leaders of our field whose voices have been suppressed and work to gather and create new embodied intellectual community oriented spaces as a professional and personal necessity. Access and empowerment in music therapy have often been linked to an approximation of power that would leverage music therapy's potential. In this, we find the fundamental flaw with our stagnant efforts towards empowerment and access. They are predicated on the unjust systems that would substantiate their existence. Any calls for access and empowerment from music therapy amplify our existence within unjust systems at best. At worst, they amplify areas we often attempt to hide that perpetuate injustice from within and contend our unanimous desire to help, to do good. However, seldomly is there a call for the tearing down of unjust systems. Seldomly is there a call for tearing down the master's house. If the systems were just, our work wouldn't need to center efforts of diversity, equity, or inclusion that at best produce strategic action and at worst propagate sincere ignorance. If our systems were just, there wouldn't need to be minority student and therapist uprisings that center their calls for justice, their concerns for a minority clients, their musicking, their positionality, their ideologies, their values, their ways of being. If the systems were just, there wouldn't be a need to define and redefine empowerment so that the traditional hierarchical nature of therapy that props up the individualistic concern for mastery and control reflected in heteropatriarchal imbalance of power in our societies may be addressed. We could tolerate clients' ability to exercise power autonomously as a political subject rather than support therapeutic approaches that overarchingly endorse therapists empowering the client versus the client holding personal agency in which they empower themselves or are empowered by their communities. Music therapy needs a multi-people movement committed to dismantling what Bell Hooks describes as imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. We need to address the oppressive regimes of racism, heteropatriarchy, empire, and class exploitation at the root of inequality, precarity, materialism, and violence in many forms as stated by Robin Kelly. One that considers culturally sustaining practice that explores oppression from a nonlinear, multidimensional praxis of interrogation. Just as the brutal murders of Black people named at the beginning of this talk amplify the intersecting oppression on violence against trans folk, cis women, disabled persons, people deemed mentally ill, who were low resource and disenfranchised and existed at the margins of our society, we must index the intersectionality of oppression that is clearly articulated by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw and described by Pumla Dio Gola, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, Chandra Talpad Mohanty. Bell hooks in teaching to transgress shares that theory is not inherently healing, liberatory or revolutionary. It fulfills the function only when we ask it to do so and direct our theorizing towards this end. To this end, I'm compelled to ask my people, when we sing, who do we sing for? And for the growing dominant mass that would declare allyship, I ask, must we sing for you too? To address these issues of social justice, all music therapists must question, in what ways does our work disenfranchise? In what ways do our lines of cultural transmission cross lines of appropriation? In what ways do we mirror theft? In what ways would we cause harm to the indigenous communities we would aim to serve? In what ways do we perpetuate harm? In what ways are our clients helped in spite of our limited recognition of harm, our willful ignorance, our overt and covert denial of our own complicity in the real physical and social death that exists at all ends of the earth? In what ways must the inherently toxic conceptualization of music therapy have to die that life may be affirmed? What if we could radically imagine new possibilities of music therapy that would recourse our trajectory? 
Recently, as my sister Monique and I prepared for protests to demand justice for Black lives, she stated, I can't sing if I can't breathe. While many would render that statement nothing short of an unfathomable act, I was drawn yet to another paradox of Black people across the African diaspora who have done the impossible. For centuries, Black people have voiced pain, struggle, joy, resistance, and liberation through song amidst bondage, enslavement, and violence, even unto death. Still, now George Floyd's legacy is required to sing on through protesters, activists, allies, while the fight for justice for Black lives continues. In so doing, we've duly demonstrated how our expression has been linked to our humanity that allows for creative reimagining of freedom. Yet Monique's words contend any proposed singularity of condition. Rather, they amplify the interconnectedness of physical death and social death on a continuum of oppression that has demanded Black people to sing or die and the radical pursuit of freedom that would allow her to resist any unfathomable impossibility. Breath, breathe, inspiration, life. If there were to be a new song, it would be one where the pomona who was seeking home would not have to resign to the afterlife for justice and freedom. If something must die, let it be every part of music therapy that serves to threaten the sanctity of freedom of oppressed peoples. Let it be anything that would threaten the radical possibility of self-determination, interdependence, resilience, and resistance. While to even fathom such a radical potential would require the recognition that master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, as Audre Lorde so profoundly stated, let death come to even the thought that the music therapy profession could ever be made whole without the, those at the margins being brought to the center. If something must live, let it be true freedom. Let it be the honor we give to all oppressed peoples that have coupled profound resistance with revolutionary love and hope. Let it be the dynamic freedom movements rising up, growing even in music therapy, the strategic planning that would transform policy, that would transform practice standards, that would transform classrooms, that would transform our understandings of our profession and ourselves. Let it be our mother's determination. Let it be our father's dignity, our family's compassion, resilience, the courage to tell their stories, our contagious laughter, our silence. Let it be our dreams and dreaming. Let it be our ability to be as real as it gets and our courage to live authentic lives. Let it be our multiplicity. Let it be all of our possibilities. Let it be Audre Lorde for not only dismantling the master's house, but our minds. Let it be Nikki Giovanni's revolution. Let it be Miriam Makeba. Let it be Nina Simone. Let it be Jamila Woods. Let it be those that have inspired you to actualize radical freedom wherever you are in the world. Let it be a new song. To the call of access and empowerment, my question to you is, what must die in music therapy to preserve human dignity? What in music therapy must die so that freedom may be affirmed? And what are our lives worth?
Hello, everyone. I'm Hiroko Miyake, speaking from Tokyo, Japan. I'd like to thank everyone involved in this Congress for inviting me and for all the hard work that goes into bringing it online. Let me start by introducing myself. I'd like to share my personal narrative by speaking about what practice and research I have been involved in, what issues I'm aware of, and what I'm doing now in relation to the theme of access and empowerment. After graduating from music college as a clarinet major, I was studying to become a music therapist while just working as a care worker in a facility for people with disabilities. What struck me at that time was the low presence that emanated from people with severe disabilities. They seemed to express themselves through a mode of communication that was different from language. For example, the rhythm of dressing, gestures, gaze, facial expressions, tone of voices, and the degree of tension in their muscles. On the other hand, in the light of medical and psychological frameworks, I have come to question how they can be deduced to mere representations of severely disabled people. It seems to me that focusing solely on a person's pathology or disability, it would obscure the person as a holistic being. In graduate school, I was introduced to culture-centered music therapy and community music therapy as a possible challenge to the idea of working with individuals and their pathologies. In my doctoral research, I explored how music therapy relates to human life. This is the Chinese character for life, ikiru. Please keep in your mind that it appears again at the end. I needed to draw on the power relations that work between client therapist, micropowers, and the institutions and the discourses surrounding the client and therapist, macropowers, in reference to Michel Foucault's idea of biopower. Randy Rolfsio's research on empowerment was also very helpful. My current research interest concerns a place where people can be together mediated by music. In other words, how different people can create a collaborative space through music. I see this theme as a common thread in both traditional forms of individual music therapy sessions, as well as in community music activity. Today, I'm going to talk about community music activity at a local community space. The location of our activity is in the Minato World and Shiba district of Japanese capital Tokyo. It is a community house named Shiba no Ie, where I organize a music activity called the Otoasobila. Shiba no Ie is located near Tokyo Tower. One of the characteristics of this place is the mix of modern and traditional. On the one hand, there are many corporate headquarters and universities, and the daytime population is about nine times as large as nighttime. There are many embassies and foreign residents in the city. On the other hand, in the 17th to mid 19th century, there was a mixture of large samurai houses and the daily lives of commoners. Today, there are still small old-fashioned houses and shops in the small alleys, as if to fill in the gaps in the business district. In short, the Shiba area is a typical example of a place where the attribute of diversity is deeply ingrained. In such a place, it is necessary 
to create a community that includes diverse people who can relate to each other, rather than one based on traditional land and blood relations. Shiba no Ie is a pioneering example of that practice. Shiba no Ie was opened 2008 with the aim of building connections between people. It serves as an ibasho, a Japanese expression meaning a place where people can feel a sense of belonging. The local resident use Shiba no Ie is visit or drop by whenever, do whatever, stay as long as they want. This way of operating is designed to allow people to loosely come together. Shiba no Ie Otoasobi Laboratory is one of the communal activities at Shiba no Ie. Their organizers of the activities are also expected to know the nature of Shiba no Ie and make use of their own characteristics. I'm involved as a facilitator of music activity while using my expertise as a music therapist. The motto of Otasabi Lab is everybody is a member of musical experimentation on equal footing. The workshop is organized by three members of the Otoasobi Lab and two staff members at Shiba no Ie. Workshop participants are roughly divided into two groups, people who come to Otoasobi Lab and those who come to Shiba no Ie. In addition, there are many people who just happen to be there. The point is that the boundaries of participation are broad and overlap. These people seem to have a loose sense of calamity as neighbors, whether they live nearby or not, and whether they come here often or not. This is the basis for the activities of Otoasobila. The activities of the Otoasobila are exploratory and interactive, like taking a detour. From time to time, in the process of taking up things that the participants feel interested, like now, I encounter resources in the form of people, things, and activities. I think of access as reciprocal, that is, at the same time as providing participants with access to music, I'm also accessing resources related to Shiba no Ie. Here, I'd like to discuss how empowerment occurs in the Otoasobi Lab through two videos. The first is waterfall performance. In this scene, participants listen to and play the sound of water using a plastic pool lent by a neighbor and cans, straws, and a musical instrument brought in by the participants. This is a staff member of Shiba no Ie and a music lover. Two senior ladies are regulars at Shiba no Ie and Otoasobi Lab. The man in the back is a musician and artist who is a member of Otoasobi staff. This woman is taking a community development course and on a one-day trial at Shiba no Ie. This Man is an Otasobi staff member and a PhD student in music research. And this boy lives nearby and the whole family frequently come to Shiba no Ie. This is me, a music therapist, facilitating the workshop. Later, a boy and his mom will join us. Please focus on how the participants inspired by each other's actions was and was, become involved in a musical performance. Oh, <laughs> 
look at what's going on in this scene. He encourages other participants to this. He, he's making sound one with stone. He affirms that. She mentions the delicate quality of the sound. Then he affirms her comment by imitating her words. Then here, the facilitator frames the performance, and the author's staff agrees and re Everyone gets ready to play. But the boy cried, no, 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 because he was unable to participate. I look at the camp in the distance and she hands it to me. Then we play the waterfall. I pay particular attention to the action of pouring water from a distance 
and the main activity. Then I invite the people in the room into the distance and the main activity. Then I invite the people in the room into the activity. <laughs> Again, the prayer begins. He listened so well to the current performance that he wanted to go to the bathroom, which the other participants sensed and laughed at, and everything ensured. Considering this as a scene of mutual empowerment by the participant, the characteristic qualities seems to be the chain of inspiration and its patchworkness of empowerment. Here, mediated by the music in with water, one participant's actions inspire another participant's actions, words, or perceptions, which in turn inspire another participant. A chain of inspiration is occurring. In the process of this chain, small pieces of empowerment complementing each other, affirming each other, making and accepting each other's proposals, accumulate like patchwork. When this process is experienced within the frame of a musical performance, it can be seen as generating mutual empowerment beyond the individual participant's intention. What the facilitator is doing is framing and reframing the performance. In the beginning, I joined in as a fellow participant and allowed the participants to be mutually inspired. A loose space was framed. Then I framed the performance. Once the performer participants became eager to explore the potential of their accumulated reciprocal actions. Also, by reframing the space, I removed the boundary that separated the inside and outside of the performance to include different people. Thus, by reframing and reframing, I'm adjusting the environment so that expressions generate from the mutual actions of diverse people. Next up is a songwriting session and a performance at the Shiba no Ie Community Festival. The song Forever and Ever Shiba no Ie was written over two years, spanning the 10th and 11th anniversaries. During that time, there was a move from the old building to a new temporary site. The right side is the lyrics of verse 1. It captures the character of Shiba no Ie, a comfortable place where anyone can drop in and take a break at any time of the day. It was written as a birthday song for Shiba no Ie. Verse 2 it describes the scene of many events that have taken place at Shiba no Ie in the past 10 years. It also shows that Shiba no Ie is a place that welcomes not only people, but also the existence of dogs, breezes, and butterflies. The song expresses gratitude for Shiba no Ie and the hope that it will continue to be a place for everyone. うん。
、まあ、急拠点を象徴する何かっていうことですよね。記憶のすりガラスのイメージは、一番端的なのは格子戸かなと。From the analysis of the lyrics, its characteristic quality seems to be the value placed on a diversity of being. On being, when discussing the relevance of the cultural context and clinical perspective of music therapy in Japan, Rika Ikuno remarks, "If the person is becoming more happier and fuller, their existence is approaching a greater well-being." Even though their functions and abilities have not changed. On Iwasho. When describing the concept of community in Japan and exploring its relationship with the practice of community music therapy, Setsu Inoue states the word Iwasho consists of two parts Iru, be exist, and Basho, place. If the community created by community music therapy is an Iwasho, the first purpose is not to do something there, but to be there. In reference to this, the community empowerment realized here could be summarized as the members' actual feeling of the fullness of each person's being in Shibanui with diverse people and beings. There are several conjugations of the Chinese character for life, say, which I showed you earlier. Ikuno and Inoue describe the Japanese mentality as guided by the concept ikiru, say, uh, to live purposefully, as well as ikasareru, to be made to live by a greater purpose. The ikasareru view of life seems to form the background to this community empowerment, which places value on the diversity of existence. Ikasareru comes from Buddhism, but doesn't have much of a religious connotation. Rather, it is being thankful for the fact that we are allowed to live with the support and cooperation of many other people. In such a case, the Japanese use this non-active word 
meaning to make oneself enter the way of being thankful. But ikasareru is very different from ikisasereru, being forced to live that way, which is the passive conjugation of live. In conclusion, referring to this idea, the process of empowerment experienced through the music activities at Shiba no Iyo to Asobila is not simply about adding power to weak individuals and pushing them towards a stronger way of life, but rather about confirming and facilitating a sense of ikasareru as a member of a community of diverse individuals who have both strengths and weaknesses. Access them could be said to be about people being open and accessible to each other's one resources. I am in the process of theorizing what I feel in my practice in Japan. I would be happy to discuss with you various issues, such as what is different and what is common to empowerment in other cultures. Thank you. Welcome to this conversation with Dr. Renee Nassen. We're doing this in a form of an interview in a world that looks and works very differently from the way it did a few months ago because of COVID-19. There are times when we need to think a bit out the box and do things a little differently due to a range of complex factors that we're all negotiating. So Dr. Nassen, would you like to introduce yourself, tell us what you do, and give us a bit of a sense of the context in which you work? Yes, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. So I'm Renee, Renee Nassen. Um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist um, based in Cape Town, and I work at a child and adolescent mental health service at a psychiatric hospital called the Lentegeer Hospital, which is out on the Cape Flats. And I'm also in what is called a joint appointment with the University of Stellenbosch. And that's where I do teaching and research. Um, the patients I serve are people who do not access uh, private health care um, from poor communities surrounding the hospital. And we provide outpatient services and we also have uh, um, awards to hospitalize adolescents and children. Thank okay. you. So from your perspective, what role do you see the arts therapies currently playing within mental health services and particularly in your specific context? Sure. Um, you know, just thinking about um, mental health in general, and of course, I, I have much more to say about child mental health, but um, just reflecting, we, we are a traumatized people, considering our history. But despite that, um, music, dance, and um, creative expression has really been incorporated into our cultural traditions. Um, we are also a nation with a high burden of mental disorders, but with tremendous bar uh, barriers to access, accessing uh, mental health services. Um, and particularly, it's around language. Um, we have a problem in that many of the therapists uh, that offer um, uh, talking cures do not speak the language of Indigenous people. The other problem is um, proximity, access to mental health services within the community. Um, and so, unfortunately, um, uh, these problems really impact on accessing uh, any kind of mental health service. Um, in my context, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist and within my unit, um, and bearing in mind that we all agree that there is a substantial evidence base for these therapies, for the arts therapies. Um, the conventional therapeutic modalities within child mental health services um, 
are, are very much reliant on verbal interaction. So um, in terms of, of what the arts therapies would offer, it would really offer a much wider range of emotional processing and exploration because it offers the opportunity for non-verbal therapeutic engagements, of course. So it's been particularly helpful and we've been fortunate enough to be able to have access at least to some or other arts therapy for the past four years and it's been very very helpful for children with a wide range of mental disorders be it depression anxiety post-traumatic stress disorder particularly that we've seen it used in our children with autism spectrum disorders and even with some with psychotic disorders and as i speak to you i uh, recall uh, very uh, being deeply moved by um, Record, uh, uh, watching a recording of a music therapy um, uh, a session with a young boy with the first episode schizophrenia, for example. I've also found in our context that the initial engagement with an arts therapist really lays the foundation for engaging in therapeutic work with a verbal kind of uh, therapeutic engagement with a, a psychologist particularly, but also with occupational therapy. Mm. Mm. And in what ways do you think that the arts therapies can offer empowerment specifically within mental health? Mm. Mm. I thought a lot about the word empowerment and, you know, to start off just thinking about it from the patient's perspective and again on the occasion when I have watched a session behind the mirror not very often so I always find it to be a, a deeply um, a privileged experience in, in a way um, my experience of it is and just observing it it's so visceral and so visible in its grace for me it's a beautiful thing to watch because it incorporates all the senses and there seems to be an immediacy in terms of its impact and there is such an invitation to participate and i just marvel at how readily for example adolescents would engage whereas the average adolescent does not want to engage in a therapeutic engagement um, and thinking about this, I remember um, in the ward round that I ran on Thursday morning um, and speaking about a young um, woman, young girl who um, is recovering from a depression. Um, she became psychotic and she's got a, a, quite a significant trauma history. And um, she was given the good news that she will be going home next week. And it was so wonderful to hear her. Um, saying, uh, reflecting on the drama therapy session that she's been receiving, and she said, I've discovered my hidden talents, talents that I didn't know I ever had. And then remembering again a young, ma uh, young man, a uh, 17-year-old with severe depression, several suicide attempts with traits of autism and I, I'm, I'm deliberately mentioning these diagnoses so that you can see that we're dealing with a severe end of mental disorders and he uh, was invited to find he said he found his voice because he could choose a favorite animal which was a lion and he was given permission to growl and to growl repeatedly <laughs> and he later on said um after he started to feel this suicidal, that the sessions made him feel alive again, that he could feel the feeling of being alive and not wanting to die. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's the incorporation of stories and the invitation to enact these themes. And so many of the adolescents would say, I feel that something was released. So that's just a, a very vivid um, description of what has been experienced in the unit. And I have no doubt that the patients have been empowered in many, many ways that we can't even imagine. But if I think about the therapists themselves, I think that there is a great opportunity for empowerment of the arts therapists who have been invited into formal clinical environments, such as the one that I run. I don't think that it is common 
uh, it does happen in some settings for arts therapists to become uh, parts of multidisciplinary teams within psychiatric units and uh, to see them working alongside the multidisciplinary teams, joining the ward rounds, being part of the management plans, I think is, is, is an opportunity for empowerment because speaking with them, um, they always describe their lives and existence, their professional existence as being quite solitary. And uh, I think that that's a great opportunity and skill set uh, almost to, um, to develop. And do you also feel like other members of the multidisciplinary team in their interaction with arts therapists could find some experiences as well that could be empowering for them too? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I wish that this interview could happen with the rest of my team. Um, and so that, you know, it could be observed how wonderfully the treatment plans are discussed and how it is planned for when the psychologist would get involved and when the arts therapist and what each one does. And certainly, and I speak for all of them to say that we've become quite dependent <laughs> on the presence of an arts therapist in our team. We've been lucky, it's been four years now. How would you describe patients' access to the arts therapies in the South African mental health context? Mm. I was thinking that I should divide this answer into kind of speaking about the public sector, the private sector, and maybe the NPO sector. And if I think about the public sector, that is the context in which I work. I really um, think, and it's true, it's not what I think, it's true, that except for um, access to the arts therapy interns, um, it is minimal to non-existent um, in the public sector. And this is not likely to improve unless post uh, there is some commitment to funding and creating um, public sector posts. But as I said, there's plenty of enthusiasm and support among mental health practitioners across the board um, for uh, inviting arts therapists into our spaces. Um, pr the private sector is a little bit better, but I don't know enough about it. But I, as you know, I, I asked you whether um, health funders, medical aids pay for uh, arts therapists and they do. And so, yes, there is better access in the private sector, but the private sector constitutes a small percentage of all people in this country who need and deserve access to um, arts therapists. And then there are the few NPOs here and there, like for example, in Cape Town Music Works who would do community-based um, uh, uh, work. But that again is, is so um, little in, in relation to what is needed. In my context, um, speaking about access, we, we were quite conscious and deliberate in our need to um, have the arts therapist in our in the unit that I had, and uh, myself and a psychologist created what we called a creative arts program in 2016. Um, I was lucky enough to be offered funding by a benefactor who was impressed with the work that we did, and she actually came to watch us do a presentation at another conference, and so for two years we actually had a music and an art therapist as part of our team. Um, it was a great success, it goes without saying, um, and uh, we could carry on for a, for a third year with some other external funding uh, for a part-time music therapist. Um, last year we hosted our first um, Fitz University Drama Therapy Intern, and over the years on and off, we've always hosted music therapy interns. Unfortunately, this year, we are relying on this drama therapy therapist to volunteer in our service. We're very grateful for it, but we actually have run out of any sort of funding, and so we are com constantly under threat that our arts program may actually cease. 
sadly. Mm. You're mentioning funding, and obviously that's a key component to access. Absolutely. Are there any other challenges um, that you'd like to highlight in terms of struggle to access arts therapies in the South mm. African mental health context? Mm. Yeah, and again, just speaking in general terms about mental health, I mean, I think it would be important to say that there are significant challenge, challenges that people with mental disorders face and then huge challenges in accessing mental health care. Um, and then with child mental health, it is even worse. Uh, we follow the worldwide trend um, in being under-resourced, especially uh, with poor to very limited community-based mental health care, as I said. And in the case of children who access community-based services, that which there is, it's not child-friendly, and so they uh, readily drop out. And there are also many socioeconomic barriers to the mentally ill. And so we really need to think about what are going to be the affordable and effective therapies that could be delivered uh, that will cross the racial barrier. In the context of children, what is vitally important is early identification and intervention. But there are all sorts of reasons why this doesn't happen. And so these young people uh, arrive late in an acute setting as teenagers, with, whereas they've had a mental disorder probably for about five, six years before they present. Um, in terms of uh, um, the challenges, there is a huge lack of awareness, I think on the part of patients and healthcare managers. And this is because there is a lack of visibility um, of the art therapies. And my question really is, could it be, and it might be because the art therapy community is quite small, or is it that they fragmented? I always think of um, uh, art therapy, music therapy, drama therapy. Um, do you operate as a collective or are you quite, um, fragmented. I don't know enough about it, but this could amplify the limited visibility and opportunity to showcase uh, or demonstrate the impact of your, your work and the, and the evidence base. Then I think there are some power issues and the relative dominance of the conventional disciplines such as psychology and maybe occupational therapy. So I'm also wondering I'm thinking I'm asking you questions rather than answering, but what are the linkages there, if any? And then there is this big issue that post for arts therapies do not exist. And so despite the substantive body of evidence, and despite the fact that um, uh, arts therapists need to register with the Health Professions Council in South Africa, in the health department, music and other arts therapies are not so-called designated professions and because of that there are no funded posts in any public health facility in the country so it's a there are political and funding constraints and i believe that the two are linked and it will require a review of existing posts and the creation of arts therapist posts rather than in addition to. And it doesn't seem to be that there's much of an appetite for this. And likely there will be a huge backlash from the conventional disciplines unless you befriend them and unless you know we find a different way of interacting with each other. And I I'm beginning to feel quite depressed <laughs> as I list all of these challenges. But anyway, that's what I think, you know, is there. Um, it's evident sometimes, um, you know, with some of the colleagues, especially the senior colleagues, actually. Yeah. I think what's positive is in the last year, 18 months, is the real rejuvenation and redesign of Sonata, the South African National Arts Therapies yeah. Association. And yeah. you're right that we were um, sort of in separate silos to a degree, but, but now we've really come together as a stronger, more unified force 
across the different arts therapies modality and so in terms of advocacy mm. and collaboration there's mm. um oh, wonderful renewed that's energy really. now and i think just like yeah. in Kanta, that's exactly what we need yeah. in yeah. our pursuit to befriend and navigate a complex political system and so i think there's a lot yeah. of hope um on that horizon what hopes do you yeah. have for moving towards a situation where access to arts therapies in South African mental health services could be enhanced? Yeah. I know you say sometimes yeah. you feel quite discouraged, but if you could let yourself <laughs> dream and hope, what would some of those well, hopes be? Well, I don't give up. That's the thing. Um, but I hope that I have the energy <laughs> to continue because I'm one of the few is convinced. Um, but in this context of of current and historical trauma and under-resourcing of mental health, we've got to continue to promote the place of arts therapies as a vehicle of emotional expression, of catharsis, and even of protest and meaning and of ritual. But how? How? So the issue is it's invisible or not visible enough. There's no light shone on the magic that I witness and what I'm exposed to in the work done by the arts therapists in my unit. Um, but it should be. So how does one go forward? And of course, and I'm sure this is such a hackneyed term, but the issue of lobbying, lobbying to raise awareness, advocacy of children's health. Maybe children's mental health is a powerful vehicle to simultaneously raise awareness and advocate for holistic approaches to mental health interventions. So I think there is an opportunity there. Um, on the other side, the arts therapies and child mental health, they're both relatively small disciplines. So both what we both need is advocacy on a large scale for example little things i've done a couple of years ago i decided to ask an artist to create a logo called children's mental health matters and in the hope that this would increase visibility um, and it went some way we even got t-shirts going and we we used the logo at conferences and it went on to our letterheads but it didn't go as far as I hoped it would. Um, if one looks at new opportunities, there are new opportunities in light of this COVID-19 pandemic, sadly, sad to say, uh, to advocate and to give inputs to the redesign of child mental health services. Because the inequities in mental health services, particularly child mental health services, has been highlighted uh, during this pandemic. And I have been extremely busy uh, trying to fend off a huge demand in the face of how little we have to offer. And so in this regard, uh, we have finally gained the attention of the senior managers in the Western Cape Department of Health. And there's been a promise and an offer for, uh, to receive a proposal from uh, a, a senior child psychiatrist uh, for a redesign of an improved child mental health service. Now, what we could do potentially is to include a mandatory requirement for the arts therapies as part of the menu of therapeutic services required. And so that is my undertaking and promise that <laughs> I will certainly do that. Um, if I look at um, my context at the hospital, the issue of um, creating a post, there was an agreement to create a post uh, two, three years ago with our previous CEO. So we went some way to starting the process and then he resigned. Um, but on a positive note, um, I've gotten an exposure to what is required. And it's quite a bureaucratic process because you've got to do benchmarking. You've got to look at uh, uh, salary scales. You've got to create a job description. Um, and so we've done some of the work. Unfortunately, um, uh, we, we kind of lost momentum but I feel quite confident that I'll be able to pick this up again with a new CEO. Um, the funding model was going to be to use um, unfilled posts 
and to actually create the post that way because that's going to be how it has to be will have to be done and then just lastly um there should be a national effort collective effort um, and programs to create to create to promote and claim music and creative arts as healing um, modality not to get the feeble user voice mobilized are we going to do this um so my question is could the congress be the means by which to leverage greater visibility and to advocate more intensely and visibly and i think again repeating myself those providing the services are convinced and would welcome the arts therapists into their workplaces so the battle needs to be a hearts and minds one a political one directed at funders, at policy makers, and at senior health managers. It is about shifting of attitude, as that is a profoundly disabling factor which will retard and subvert any advocacy initiative. Um, so, the opportunity that this conference provides is to present the evidence, engage in a scientific exchange but also to present this urgent agenda to the population at large. And I believe that when they see, they will understand. This sentence, I think, is a line from a song by Coldplay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nesson. You're a real warrior and we've appreciated your support and advocacy and just feels like you're you're a friend to the arts therapies and we really just appreciate and value you and thank you for your time today and all your insights i know it seems like a mountain to climb but you also bring a sense of resilience and creativity yes. and passion to the task that's at hand and as much as you identify the challenges i also My feel pleasure. inspired listening to you so thank you so much for that thank you thank you very thank much you. It's lovely to be here presenting at this spotlight panel on access and empowerment with these esteemed colleagues. It's also uh, very gratifying to be at the first online World Congress of Music Therapy and I appreciate the privilege of being able to present in this forum. My contribution is going to be to talk about the relevance of music therapy for children with disabilities in the context of inclusive education. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about myself so you have a context for what I'm going to say. Then I'm going to talk about the journey I've experienced as New Zealand has moved from systems of special education to mainstreaming and more latterly to inclusion. I'm going to talk about some of the difficulties associated with these systems and how they relate to the practice of music therapy and some possibilities moving forward. So who am I? I acknowledge that my contribution will be influenced by my privileged position as an older, white, heterosexual, mostly abled-bodied woman living in a beautiful first world country who has, at least at the time I prepared this presentation, a full-time position in academia. It will be also influenced by my work as a music therapist in special schools and units in New Zealand, my work with music therapy students in schools in New Zealand, and my experiences as a mother, grandmother and aunt of children living with disabilities. I also acknowledge that inclusive education isn't just about children with disabilities. It's about respecting and including all children with their diverse bodies, genders, sexualities, languages, and other cultural indicators. However, it's from the disability stance and predominantly the Australasian stance 
that I offer some thoughts that I believe will inform and resonate with others. Diversity is a natural phenomenon which should be accepted, respected and celebrated. Yet people with disabilities who make up 10 to 15% of the developed world's population continue to be marginalized and exposed as vulnerable due to society's tendency to focus on their disabilities rather than their unique abilities and traits. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2008 prompted legislations and policy frameworks at local, national and global levels which aim to promote and protect the full participation of people with disabilities in their communities. Policymakers and educators globally are now explicitly striving to make schools accessible and accepting of all children and young people. There's now international recognition that every person has the right to be educated, to be involved in cultural and leisure activities, and to develop their talents. However, the gap between legislation and implementation remains wide as people with disabilities strive for independence and meaningful participation in all aspects of life. For example, since the late 1980s, children with disabilities in many parts of the world have been granted access to mainstream schools. This has enabled them to be present at their local schools with typically developing peers. This, however, has not necessarily provided them with typical experiences. The philosophy of mainstreaming remains underpinned by the medical model of disability which suggests children with disabilities have individual problems which need to be fixed. So children are regularly removed from classrooms for individual teaching, often by, delivered by teacher's aides and for various forms of therapy, including music therapy. They remain immersed in language and processes such as testing, diagnosis, treatment, intervention and remediation. And this is still an exclusive way of thinking and working. The more recent emergence of inclusive education involves redefining the purpose of education and it demands a transformation of schools. Educators are challenged to adapt, modify or develop curriculums and assessment regimes to ensure they're accessible to all children, including those with disabilities. The goal is to provide rich learning opportunities for all learners, grounded in values of equity, participation, community, sustainability and respect for diversity, and ultimately to ensure that all children and staff have good social and emotional health, and the community has an overall sense of well-being. In New Zealand, we're reportedly doing well in this regard with several commentators suggesting that we have one of the most inclusive education systems in the world. There are many schools in New Zealand where all children, including those with significant disabilities, are fully engaged with the curriculum and other school activities. At a recent conference in New Zealand, young people with disabilities described some of the rich opportunities that they were being afforded in their local schools, including taking international trips and participating in school productions. Importantly, they also said that they were taking part in daily life with their peers, making good friends, and that they had developed good relationships with teachers. However, they also reported that there are times when they have not been consulted or have been excluded, and this is backed up by recent data from the Ministry of Education which suggests that many children and their families still feel unsupported and unwelcome at their local school. Some schools till, still advise parents of disabled children that their child would be better off elsewhere, or they will not enroll disabled children who don't bring additional funding, 
or they might suggest that they can only attend part time. Many teachers misunderstand and remain apprehensive about inclusive education because they see it as an ideological rather than a practical idea. If they don't have the necessary knowledge and skills to meet the needs of diverse students, they're likely to lack confidence to seek alternative placements outside the classroom or to pass responsibility for disabled students onto teachers' aides or therapists. Further, there's often expectation in schools that teachers and therapists will embrace the prevailing ethos of the school and learn from more experienced staff. This passing the baton approach means everyone is acculturated to existing processes. It's understandable that music therapists or music therapy students who are keen to gain or maintain employment might fall in line with what's expected of us, not only because it's easier, but also because we'll be appreciated for it. Music therapy searches have found that we need to feel connected to and validated by other professionals and that our collaboration with school teams can be impeded by fear of losing our professional identity. When teachers, parents or children themselves continue to see us as allied health specialists, whose role it might be to remove children from the classroom, we can tell ourselves we're offering the child a little oasis from the challenges of the classroom, providing an opportunity for them to participate in meaningful activity, which will contribute to their learning and development. We're enabling them to access music and so on. But when we provide therapy to individuals or small groups in schools, we're highlighting the children's difference and the difficulties that they have managing the curriculum and the classroom. And this in turn protects the status quo, justifying and strengthening the idea that expert intervention is in the child's best interest. Another reason to protect the status quo is that special education systems might be easier for us to engage with professionally and fiscally. Special schools provide us with a captive population and I recognise the irony of this term. Special schools in New Zealand at least typically manage their own funding and this means that they have more opportunity to directly employ music therapists to be part of their allied health teams. Inclusive schools do not, and philosophically should not, have funding for children with special needs. When resources are scarce, people tend to protect their status and the material advantage they have over others. So as music therapists, we need to be aware of the possibility that we desire to maintain the status quo because it gives us professional and personal security. So what is the relevance of music therapy in inclusive education contexts? Criticism of the professional discourse and the withdrawal approach doesn't mean that professionals are not needed in schools. And it's not meant to suggest that children don't ever need medical care and support. But it does challenge us to think about how, when and why we might provide music therapy support. Inclusion is about children developing a sense of belonging and having equal opportunities to participate in school activities. So supporting teachers to understand and experience genuinely inclusive activities is a good place to start. Music provides children with disabilities opportunities to engage in activities that are meaningful and purposeful and can facilitate their happiness, connectedness and creativity. A cyclic process can result with music leading to the development of positive relationships with peers and teachers which in turn results in children experiencing support and acceptance and feeling connected to school. 
So music and communities are therefore likely to be more inclusive communities. And when children with disabilities are fully included, their peers learn about how different individuals make their way in the world and teachers learn new skills which are useful for all children. Despite the challenges, many teachers and therapists do wish to work in mutually empowering ways with learners. In our book, Creating Cultures of Music in Schools, Katrina McFerrin and I have described ways of working in schools that embrace the values of mutuality, empowerment, respect, and commitment. And we provide what we hope is a practical model for building more inclusive and empowering music cultures in schools. We like the idea that music therapists can employ resource-oriented and participatory approaches to enhance the well-being of children and staff generally. And we advocate for music therapists to collaborate with all willing participants in schools, including school leaders, teachers, as well as students, to empower them to develop inclusive and sustainable music programs. Since we released our book, there seems to have been a gradual increase in publications describing music therapists working collaboratively within classrooms or with whole school communities. I don't have time in this presentation to reference individual projects, but the Music Matters program from Australia provides an example of multiple projects focused on the ways music programs can support belonging, connection, and overall well-being. An important finding from these multiple projects was the fostering of new forms of relationships between different members of the school community, including school leaders seeing troubled students differently, peers being more inclusive, and teachers discovering new talents in students that they had known for some time. Inclusion involves understanding diversity and challenging the hegemony of the norm. Not only what we understand is normal about bodies and minds, but also what we consider to be normal attitudes and practices. Until we challenge our own assumptions, we cannot begin to engage in genuine collaborations or to understand what empowerment might mean to the people we work with. This means that music therapists need to be actively reflexive. And if we work in schools to consider how our own beliefs, attitudes, and knowledge frameworks align with inclusive philosophy, as well as how they might align with the beliefs and attitudes of school communities. And we need to be prepared to be unsettled by what we discover. It can be painful to learn how our own actions are creating or contributing to the problems we experience. And we also need to have the skills and confidence to critique the philosophies and practices of schools that have deeply ingrained cultures if necessary. We can't leave the responsibility for building more inclusive societies to others. Just as societies are rethinking the role and design of schools, we need to be proactive in rethinking roles for music therapists within inclusive schools. If we're to work in inclusive educating settings, we need to collaborate with children, families, educators, other therapists, and wider communities to consciously disrupt marginalizing processes in schools. As Luke Annesley suggested in 2014, part of the job of therapists in schools can be to hold on to an alternative viewpoint, to be advocates for a different agenda, and to help the school with its holistic responsibilities. He said, as outsiders, we can stand up for what we believe, no matter how unpopular or risky those beliefs might be. And when we challenge assumptions, we might find that understandings and actions change too. Before finishing, I want to acknowledge that the impetus for this paper came from personal experience of recognizing that despite advocating for music therapists to take new roles to promote inclusive schools, 
I was still doing what was easiest and buying into the status quo by supporting music therapy students on placement to withdraw children from classrooms. Music therapy students or graduates who are going into their first positions are particularly at risk of being acculturated to pre-existing ethos. Music therapy training institutions therefore have a responsibility to ensure that students and new graduates have the skills to advocate for and to carry out collaborative work in regular classrooms or wider school environments. However, I also want to acknowledge that changing cultures takes time. It's important for children to experience the little oases that music therapy can provide when classrooms are overwhelming for them. It's important for music therapists to provide opportunities for children to participate in meaningful activity, which will contribute to their learning and development when teachers are not able to provide such opportunities. And it's important that all children have access to music. However, I don't want us to forget that music therapists have unique skills to support inclusive making in schools and to support the development of inclusive schools because sharing music enables diverse people to experience a profound togetherness that's difficult to achieve in other ways. I therefore value all the small steps we're taking towards inclusive music making in schools because we're gradually contributing to alternative regimes of truth that will lead to more inclusive practices and policies across the board. My final thought is that access is fundamental to participation, participation is fundamental to inclusion, and real inclusion can lead to empowerment. I'm going to put my references up shortly, but before I do, I want to thank you all again and to invite you to be in contact with me by email if you have any questions and comments about my presentation that are not answered in the discussion that's to follow. Thank you uh, again for this opportunity and uh, thank you for listening to my paper. Kia ora, ka kite anō. As they come, um, maybe just to help us reflect a little bit, just your first impressions of this conversation, uh, what you have heard from somebody's presentation, what you yourself are reflecting after the fact that you have you have actually made the presentation. I think for a little moment.
Did you hear me? <laughs> Sorry, who, who are you calling on? <laughs> so any, anybody who just wants to have the first first word or a reflection on what you have heard either from uh, somebody else's presentation or from your own presentation after listening to it yourself after reflecting on, on your presentation um, just a reflection on that Thank you. I, I'm happy to um, begin. I think that there are some lovely themes through these actually quite contrasting um, pieces of work. Um, and just reflecting on my work in relation to what was offered, um, I think that the important messages are that um, education can't be separated from broader social context. So thinking about the the work that uh, Marisol presented to us, um, school cultures are influenced by history and political context and as, as well as the management of the school and school values determine what's taught, how it's taught, how success is measured, um, expectations of the way staff and students will behave. So the school cultures reflect the shared values and beliefs and attitudes um, and traditions and behavioural norms of the people within it, particularly as school, school leaders. Um, and as I said in my presentation, New Zealand is considered to have one of the most inclusive education systems in the world. And this is undoubtedly related to our adherence to the principles of Te Tariti o Waitangi, which is the treaty which was signed in 1840 by representatives of the British Crown and Maori chiefs. Now this is not without controversy I have to say but it has some beautiful primary principles which provide a foundation for decision making in all aspects of our lives including health, education, justice, social welfare. And these principles are presence, participation and partnership and they encourage whānau, which is the Māori word for families, educators and children to develop collaborative and respectful learning communities. Now these are lovely ideals and I'm not sitting here to say that New Zealand's got it right for sure. We have lots and lots of problems. But I think this idea of collaboration and partnership and presence, bringing people front and centre of their own lives is incredibly important. And so, you know, just particularly Marisol's work, but the, the, the words of uh, Dr. Nasa and the demonstration that that Hiroko gave us of this, the, these ideas in practice was just beautiful. So um, I, I think there's some lovely connections between our work. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just your thoughts at the moment, and reflections or, or you know, feelings about what you have heard in the space? じゃあ。えっと、皆さんの発表を聞いていて、あの、文化や社会によってその、何でしょう、え、問題の現れ方というのはすごくあの、本当に違うんだなということを思いました。えっと、ま、マリソルの場合には、え、例えばすごくシャ
presentation, that problem was manifested in very sharp ways, very clear ways of structure. And in Daphne's presentation, it was discussed in a kind of visible uh, ways, how to act in daily lives kind of things. And in my own presentation, like in Tokyo, things are more complicated and invisible in different ways from Daphne's case. Um, so I in Tokyo, probably it's more it's like a netting, net, network problem. It's so different that I felt. I think although the context is very different, the core or essential of the problems are very similar. Uh, I know that we can co cooperate to think about and deal with these problems. Yes, and I would just add to that. I think to me, the plan is very clear. Um, what what I'm drawn to, and and I think again that deals with my own positionality and what everyone said, our own context, um, is really the calls for um, recognition of the various experiences from our clients <laughs> um, and our student body. So I think that the communities, what I'm hearing within. Roku's wonderful presentation and also Daphne's wonderful presentation as well as Renee's is that within those communities there are um, people that are feeling that they're disenfranchised and so it's not just a, again an intellectual conversation it's something that is lived it's felt um, it has a, a, a political weight as Renee has said and and that if we don't tend to it if we don't tend to it, there are repercussions on how we perceive our own legitimacy in in the field, um, in the in the health profession, right? In the health, um, in our health practices. So I think that there there's a very through um, a very clear through line of people that are at the margins, or even our clients at the margins asking for or demanding for more and and how we respond to that has a very um uh, vital um vital uh point to play within our own longevity as a profession mm. Yeah, what I'm hearing quite clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go I, on down. I think I would, I, I would like to respond to that um, in line with a question that um, has come up in the Q and A box, which is about um, providing um, or creating spaces and access for music therapists who are differently abled. So not only thinking about how we work with people who are differently abled, but how as a group of professionals we can think about greater uh, diversity within our, our ranks. And um, my thoughts, my initial thoughts about that is that I know we do have music therapists who identify as differently abled. So going back to Marisol's um, point, do they need to identify, is it important to them to have that as a cultural identity, as, as you know, how does how does that sit within the politics, the context in which they 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 work? So, um, you know, do we need, for example, to publicly highlight the difference in order to value them? Um, if disability is part of their cultural identity, one would hope that they are able to share it with pride, uh, especially in the much more open environment that we have. You know, this conference has has really demonstrated to me that there is um, an openness to, to people claiming their difference, claiming the things that they value uh, about themselves. Um, 
and some have. But I also want to acknowledge that I identify as being on the autism spectrum, and I've not always felt the need to declare it publicly. I talk about it when it seems relevant to do so. So um, <laughs> it, it's, it's just interesting, that idea about whether we need spaces for difference, um, because also when I think about special schools, um, I would love the idea that we could go back to having places that are special because people uh, want to be there, not because we put them there or because um, they feel a need to be together because they're uncomfortable in other environments, but they are together to celebrate their cultural uniqueness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're very complicated concepts that we're dealing with, and, you know, there are not easy answers to these things, are there? Yeah, and I'm, I'm sitting here with, with a sense of of the complexity of, of, of this particular way of working and, 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 and act, you know, access and empowerment at the same time. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, following a question about sitting, uh, I, think, I think you may have mentioned, um, Marissa, about sitting with the discomfort and allowing that discomfort to be part of how we work. How do we imagine, because sometimes we almost think we are, and, and, and we imagine therapy as the work of, of, of making comfortable. And how do we imagine therapy as not just the work of making comfortable and, and thinking of, wor of working to disturb so that something new can emerge? Yeah, I think that I think you've already kind of situated it very profoundly in that um, there is there is a uh, there is a thread within our work that seeks to reinforce the comfort. So I think. Um, uh, Kat McFerrin mentioned or asked, you know, why why are we so connected to these different systems of oppression? Because these systems of oppression have mechanisms to reinforce themselves each time we try to shift those, those systems. And so um, for us, uh, I think there are models of of how catastrophic change or discomfort leads to something that's productive. It's part of our life and death cycle. It's part of our the ways in which we understand ourselves. Um, we think about dissonance in music and tension and how that is um, also as important as consonants and all the variations in between. So there are multiple things that, that points us to this need um, from our music and from different points of our understanding However, I think that there are times that actually, and this is kind of going a little bit tangential from your question, but I think there are times in which we use even our music as a way to distract or to cover up and mask this possibility of tension. And so we, we have not only our, our well-known established um, structural mechanisms and systems that may be seen in our academic um, uh, training in, in different um, access and resources within our various um, community um, health settings. Um, but we also, there's, we have a, a additional level of how music is conceptualized that is sometimes very reductionistic of, it, what, of its use, but then also we have ways in which we use music to placate and to suppress some of the realities of this level of discomfort when it comes to us as a field, as just another system or another complex network that is is asking us in many ways to manage this type of tension. But it's again, how do we how do we um, try to auto correct that? And there are multiple reasons why we do that. It could be the cognitive dissonance that we experience to think that um, we could possibly cause harm in these particular ways. Um, it's the reinforcement of, 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 again, of societal systems that are actually so commonplace. So you have to actually seek these ideas out in order to even consider that, that there's something that needs to be changed if you are um, a part of a, a dominant 
lens, even though I'm a, I'm a black woman and that may give me um, at least two spaces where I can experience marginality in the US, the I have I hold a lot of privileges and in those privileges when we think about ability and, uh, and, uh, and other aspects of um, nationality, nationality, um, nationalism, things of those natures, we have or language like we have to off we have to really uh, hone into those things and try to deconstruct them and be proximal with other communities, be in relationship with other communities that are understand it more <laughs> and are able to call it out. And so I think that there are um, multiple ways in which we can engage in this very complex conversation. Mm, thank you. Uh, Hiroko, I'm sitting here as somebody who doesn't speak the English language as my first language, it's actually it's actually my dominant language now, but it's not my first language. And you are part of a community that is predominantly English speaking. How do you reflect about your work in collaboration with an international community that is so reliant on the English language and, and English symbolisms? あの、それは実際私にとってはとてもストレスフルです。ですね。ストレスフルです。それはえっと、なぜかというと、その言葉によってその認識の構造が全く違うから。Because it's not only the language to communicate, but language holds holds a whole different cultural structure and I think differently, different course than yours. I feel like I am fragmented in my thoughts when I think in English. でも、え、なぜ私が今こうしてえ、通訳を使っているのもここにえ、で話をしたいかというと、え、私が経験している、え、アクセスであったり、エンパワーメントの、え、質とか、え、その在り方というものを皆さんにシェアしたいし、え、
Marissa did, okay. yeah, Marissa did indicate at some at some point in in her response to the previous question about um, negotiating even the whole concept of music uh, and asking ourselves the question of what actually makes music uh, and even the language itself that we use, music itself. What does that actually mean? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry. And I, I wanted to say that I think that I think just as Hiroko has mentioned time and time again, it is also the context of of the space where you think about this. For me, and within my U.S. context and my Jamaican context as well, and African diaspora context, I, I often th I often think about um, the meaning that the people that are oppressed have to its use, right? And so I think that, and I'm not sure if I have the answers. <laughs> I want to say that first. I don't think I necessarily have the answers for such a huge question that we as a field are, um, feels like we're just starting to really engage. Um, but I do think that there are many ways in which we sometimes think cultural transmission or cultural appro appreciation um, is is the work of music therapy and at times a lot of our not only our um the use of maybe a, a particular song but the, the the all the things that a particular song may encompass um is um can be appropriate and used in a space and then can perpetuate harm for example i was for my doctoral research i looked at um uh, black aesthetics within a vocal music therapy session or group for chronic pain. And in that particular group, there was, there was a use of various um, um, songs that were um, part of the, the culture of the, the clients. And then there were songs that, um, that the therapist made up in kind of response to what the, 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 the clients may need. And in the use of some of the songs, for example, um, this is not traditionally a uh, uh, West African song, but um, it is oftentimes, it uses Yoruba language, um, Fonga Alafia Ashe Ashe. That song is used within, um, was used within this particular therapeutic setting. And because of the different associations that the clients had to the music, they internalized a, a musical matrix that had to do with the, evo the um, evoking spirits, um, that had to do with the worship of various um, Yoruba gods, right, or Osha or Orishas. Right? There was um, a, a wider matrix than what um, was originally um, conceived by the therapist in that particular space. And so when all of these different, re um, these different themes start to manifest, when clients said, oh, I'm not sure if I want to be in this space because something might jump into me, kind of thinking about um, uh, spiritual um, uh, possession and things of that nature that is very complex in itself. It's extremely complex to think about what that looks like from a, like a transatlantic um, and non-knowledgeable, um, even for people that aren't completely knowledgeable of even Yoruba practices, but um, to have those experiences kind of manifest within a space. I think that what we, what we, what it highlights to me is that the work that we do to understand the music that's used is way too superficial in, in its formulation. For if we were to take more time to actually um, unpack the multiple ways that music in itself, as not just a singular reduction of, of, of sound and a composite, um, a, compo a sense of, or a construction of different sounds, um, and not just um, an experience that is linked to memory, um, nor is it an experience that lives, links to emotion and senses, but how it's linked to a very complex historical framework. If we were able to, to, to keenly start to um, build skills around that analysis, then we would be able to more clearly understand these concepts of um, appropriation, and then we can ask ourselves the questions that we need to ask as whether we are um, working to perpetuate harm that's linked to appropriation, or if there are ways in which we can reduce it. 
And sometimes it's about this acknowledgement of what's taking place or the acknowledgement of the histories of the work. Um, that's oftentimes something that would suffice in some communities. But then for others, that might not be enough because it, it, there has to be an honor, uh, honoring and also an, a reverence <laughs> to, to, um, to those practices. So I think that it's widely complex. And I think what, what our, our first step will need to be a more complex analysis of the various ways music is conceived, experienced, embodied, it's linked to the spiritual realm that is oftentimes kind of um, uh, exercised out of our work as well, and, and see where that can take us. Thank you, Maris. Maris, oh, sorry. Go, go Dr. Harika. Uh, I like to have my uh, uh, talk. Uh, talk. No. <laughs> uh. Even though we, we too are in the same Japanese culture, we listen to music in different way, uh, recognize differently, and act on it differently. それだけではなくて、その音楽に関する違いに関してもそれは一体どこから来るのかっていうことをこう見極めながらお互いに新しい音楽のフレームワークというものを作っていく。それが即興であってもえ、既成の音楽であっても、そういうことは必ずやっている
Tür da öffnen. And I think that um, um, additionally, it's important to. I think someone also mentioned collaboration in in this in the chat. I think there's a level of collaboration, actually, uh, and also coalition <laughs> that needs to be made um, so that we can further understand our work. Um, I think this conference, of course, is my first time at a World Congress, so I'm already um, so excited about the opportunity to have these international um, dialogues. But I think that there there needs to be specific and very intentional dialogues around these ideas of cultural appropriation. Um, at length, and there needs to be uh, these very intentional dialogues around cross-cultural um, and even monocultural uh, uh, difference in sameness and, and what that means. And so I think that there we need to start considering um, how we can make um, broader networks um, in order to answer these questions um, with with a great level of intentionality. Um, I'm part of the Black Music Therapy Network. That space was, I, I founded that space with the intention that there is a lot of knowledge within the ways in which we're interpreting um, the work, how we're reading our work um, from the margins. And if we have enough spaces that are created where we can start to dissect that, and then not only just dissect the work, but think about what gives us vitality and what, what is our humanity linked to. If we can start constructing those new, or and not, sometimes not new, <laughs> ways of understanding ourselves, then we actually move the field along. Um, we move not only our work and our and our desires for community and our, and our aspirations along, but we move music therapy to its new wave. And I think that that is um, this idea of co coalition building, of, of being intentional, of having these conversations and not being just an intellectual exercise, but it being something that is seen as urgent and necessary for any type of development within our field. That needs to be at the forefront of our mind and, and probably the next um, the continuation of this conversation, asking more questions. Thank you. <laughs> 傾向多くの人との対話があってこそ可能になると思うので、そのようなことをしていきたいと思っています。We are creating this kind of collaboration and network. We have to face a lot of differences, and and there are a lot of differences which I think very productive. But also I think these problem visible ones are foreground of the scenery. But there are lots of background differences, which is not visible right now. I think for us, it is very important to be always conscious about these invisible differences, uh, resonating each other, making a network. And I have to, we have to cherish them as the part of the world to create the new dialogue. So thank you very much, Dr. Hiroko Miyake, Dr. Daphne Rickson, and Dr. Marissa Norris uh, for the stimulating conversation. And as you all indicated, this is just probably the beginning of many conversations of this nature to, to happen going forward. And, and we are all left with with questions. In my language, we talk about bubble fish. You know the bubble fish, the slippery fish. At the end of the conversation, we never conclude anything. We just let them bubble up. You know, they just bubble on. 
and, and maybe we can just leave the conversation here today with with open doors and open windows uh, for us to continue to engage. Um, I'm left with a question about what you know what what a whole person is in the room. That a person is a historical person, and so when somebody walks into the room. Uh, they're coming with their own histories and their own experiences and their whole ecological being. Uh, and, and so therapy cannot continue to be a neutral space and it cannot continue to be a neutral experience. It's very political uh, and, and we know that from a physical or, or bodily, ex uh, bodily experiences. And also it, has, it also raises the question of what therapy room means. What is a therapy room? What is, it, what is therapeutic space in this sense? So there the are lots of questions around this. Um, and maybe we can leave those questions here for now and we continue the conversation in other spaces. So thank you very much. And thank you all for following us and, and for being with us in this particular space. Bye.